Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this morning's session, SWIFT for Real-Time Payments. Um, my name's Bill Doran, and I'm head of Oceania for SWIFT. Uh, they cover, that covers the geographies of Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands. And I was a sales lead from SWIFT on the new payments platform tender process. Um, so today's session will mostly be about that project. So the format of today will be a quick 10-minute presentation from myself, really just to give a bit of background on the project, uh, the, the history of it, and uh, how we got to where we are, and of course the status updates on, on where we're at. Um, before, we'll have a panel discussion with some senior representatives from the Australian payments industry who are up here on stage with me. And uh, we only have 45 minutes, so I'll ask you to keep any questions related to the presentation to, to the panel session uh, when we get to there. So first of all, just a bit of background on the, um, the project. And um, it was about five years ago now that the Reserve Bank of Australia initiated uh, a process to review innovation in the, in the payment system. And they did this in the form of a consultation. And a, pub a paper was published in June 2012 uh, where they communicated their findings. And I'll let uh, David Brown um, from the Reserve Bank give a little bit more background as to why they conducted that. But the, the, the findings are the most industry the uh, initial, um, sorry, the, um, the challenge for the industry was, was uh, expressed in the form of five initial strategic objectives, and they're listed here on the right. And the first one relates to the bulk payment system, which was already a system established, but uh, it relates to a drive to, towards same-day settlement for that system, and that was achieved in, in 2013. But it was the remaining four objectives that were of most interest to the industry, because it was those objectives that... Uh, were lending themselves to uh, a new payment system in Australia. And the first of those was uh, the, the ability to have real-time payments uh, between um, consumers and people, uh, whereby the funds would be made available to the recipient in real time, in seconds. The second was that there needed to be the ability to have more complete remittance data with the payment. So today we have a very restricted um, capability in the system in terms of the number of characters you can enter into a payment. So the, the ability to expand that dramatically was, was one of the requirements. Payments outside of normal banking hours, so um, no more nine to five banking, uh, moving to an environment of 24 seven, um, 365 days a year. And finally, an easier addressing mechanism that um, that makes it simpler to route payments within the system because today you need to know the BSB or the sort code and the account number of the recipient in order to, to route that payment. But there should be a simpler mechanism such as something that everybody knows, like a person's mobile phone number. So how did the industry respond to this challenge issued by the Reserve Bank? Well, the Australian Payments and Clearing Association, APCA, pulled together uh, what was called the real time real-time payments committee, and that was made up of representatives from the Australian financial industry. And together they worked on uh, a model for a new payment system, and they uh, described that model in a document that was titled The Proposed Way Forward, and that was submitted to the Reserve Bank for, for comment. Um, and within that document they proposed the development of a new payment system for Australia that would sit alongside the existing payment systems. And one of the innovative features of the, the model they proposed was this separation of the basic infrastructure, um, which were the, 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 you know, the components needed for the, the basic clearing and settlement messaging, from what was termed overlay services, which is where the, the commercialization of, of the, the payment system would occur. It would need to allow for, uh, it would need to be a simple model and encourage innovation on the edge. So, Try and don't try to overcomplicate what we're, we're building here. Make it a simple clearing and settlement uh, message uh, system and allow for the innovation to occur with the, the members who need to build those customer propositions. It should obviously allow for, for broad participation. And the, ad the addressing proxy that uh, is the simpler addressing mechanism was to be part of the, the basic infrastructure. And there would be a new utility company uh, formed to operate the system. Later, that is what became incorporated as MPP Australia Limited. 
And this industry proposal was um, submitted to the RBA, was endorsed by the RBA, and then we entered into an RFP process. So SWIFT were involved in this initiative right from the very beginning. Um, in Australia, we saw a unique opportunity to develop a new type of payment system that would extend the cooperative's capabilities. And it would also allow us to keep pace with what we saw was happening globally, which seemed to be a trend towards in instant payments. So it was a very, very good opportunity for us, a very, very structured process, and which allowed us to engage early and, and go along the journey with the industry. So we continuously consulted um, the market to understand the various dynamics, and we went into the process with some basic guiding principles. So of course we needed to solve for the industry's strategic objectives, but that's not just what the, the central bank or the regulator was trying to achieve, it's, it's also what the what's at the heart of the, the members who will pay for the majority of the system. Um, we wanted to reuse as much technology as possible, and, and reuse, we mean reusing the SWIFT um, uh, investment that many of these organisations had made over many of years. We wanted to focus on the areas where the industry can collaborate, and not try to get caught up in, in um, you know, fun functionality that's not really needed in a, in a central system, really just focus on the areas where the banks wish wanted to collaborate, and of course, it needed to be reliable and secure. That, that's paramount in these types of systems. It's one of Swiss strengths, and we wanted to, to emphasize that. But of course, you're dealing with a cooperative who is owned by the industry, um, and we have a, a unique governance structure, and we can't overpromise on things. So we were very um, um, truthful in the way we responded to the, the process and the timeframes we could commit to and the functionality that we could provide in that time frame. So we always wanted to be up front. The industry knew who they were dealing with and exactly what we, we were committing to. And of course, we wanted to share and leverage our experience. When we, we hadn't done a real-time payment system of this nature before, but we'd been involved in market, market infrastructure developments for, for many years, and uh, this was um, an evolution of that, if you like, and we wanted to share and, and leverage our experience of, um, of that system-wide type of innovation. And in terms of the, the cost that we, um, or the, the proposal that we put on the table to industry, it was always built around a model of cost recovery plus a modest margin. We're not a, a for-profit company. We return our profit to our owners, and therefore we, we had a different uh, mentality when entering into the, uh, the pricing discussion. So, at the end of an extremely competitive tender process, um, spanning many years, um, on December, Second last year, we signed the contract to build Australia's new, new payments platform. So what is the new payments platform? This is just a high-level diagram to, to explain, I guess, the, the major um, components. The basic infrastructure, which I've referred to, is com comprised of three main components. There's the network piece, so the, all the connect connectivity components that connect the participants. And then on top of the network, you need a switch to orchestrate the, the um, clearing and settlement messages between the participants and handle all of the routing aspects. And then there's the addressing database, which is the um, um, uh, simple addressing mechanism based around unique identifiers such as um, mobile phone numbers or email addresses. And it's those three components which form the, the basic infrastructure. The Reserve Bank of Australia provides an important piece to this solution, they are providing what's called the fast settlement service. So that will be a 24-7 uh, service that's available um, that will respond to settlement requests line by line. So every single transaction that flows through this system will settle immediately with the Reserve Bank's fast settlement service. So incredible, incredibly big challenge for them as well to, um, to implement that service, but again, well on track and, and in line with um, the industry's progress. There'll be direct participants that connect directly to this system, but there'll also be indirect participants who are typically smaller institutions who will rely on the services provided by the direct participants. And of course, the all-important overlay services we've referred to that will, uh, over time, start making use of this new infrastructure. And together, that's, that's what's referred to as the MPP, those components. So how will the system work? And I'm going to refer to my notes here because I want to take you through a, um, a good use case. Um, so this diagram shows a payment flow between two of the participants in the system and the settlement with the Reserve Bank's fast settlement service. And if we take a basic use case of 
one person trying to pay some money to their friend using a banking app supplied by their bank. Um, the way it will work will be as follows. So number one on the diagram, you see the payer initiating the payment using their banking app. And since they don't yet know the BSB and account number for the, um, for the recipient or their friend, um, they will instead direct the payment using their friend's mobile phone number. And their bank will do the lookup to the addressing database to determine where their friend banks. And the addressing database will return that information to the, um, to the sending bank. And that information will be things like the account number, the BSB number, which allows the bank to then determine where they need to route that payment. So now that the bank knows the, where the friend banks, they will initiate an ISO 20022 payment instruct instruction and send it to the beneficiary bank, who would do some basic checks to determine whether the funds can be applied. And then they'll return the response with another ISO 20022 message. They can decide to post the funds immediately or wait for the settlement, to, settlement confirmation to be received, which would happen uh, in a matter of seconds later. And upon receipt of the clearing instruction, now we're on to number three, the SWIFT payments gateway, so this is the software that forms part of the distributed switch, will automatically generate the settlement instruction and send that to the fast settlement service at the Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank will respond to both sides of the transaction to advise that settlement has completed. And all of this completes in a matter of seconds. So the diagram also shows the all-important overlay services at the top. Now, the overlay services could be as simple as a set of SLAs agreed between the participants. They all abide by these rules. Or it can be a directly connected system and exchange non-value information with the participants and later initiate payment requests to the participants to complete some service or transaction lifecycle that forms part of their offering. Now, we don't yet know how many overlay services that there will be exactly, or what they'll do. But the important thing is that the framework of MPP allows for these overlays and encourages these overlays, which will mean that we should have a much more dynamic payment system that serves the needs of the Australian industry well into the future. Now, it's important to note that not all of these messages, that all of these messages will flow within the Australian geography. Nothing is flowing through SWIFT operating centres, um, none of the global operating centres. Um, it means that we're able to operate a 24-7 low latency service in country without affecting any of the existing SWIFT services. But it doesn't mean that we're not reusing any of the SwiftNet components. Um, the SwiftNet connectivity that the banks have all invested in, the VPNs, the HSMs, those can be reused. We have software such as the, the SwiftNet link, if some of you know Swift software, and the, the web platform software, that, that will be reused or can be reused. And then the whole PKI infrastructure, which is the security layer, that, that also will be re reused. Plus a data, cent a data warehouse capability that um, we have to date. So just to turn to where we are in the program, so we've just completed a major milestone around design, and the industry and SWIFT have moved into a, a build and internal test phase. That will run for um, the first half of next year, um, before industry will also start down a path of industry test. Uh, and those, those, pro those programs are running parallel, and target of a go-live is second half of 2017. But in some ways, that's, that's the start of the journey, because he will have these new rails, this new platform in place, and this is where the, the, the dynamism of, of what we're, we're building here should come into play, where we can have multiple overlay services defined and um, launched into the future. So with that short intro, I'll move to the um, panel discussion. And I'll just do a quick introduction of, of the panelists. So from left to right, Craig Kennedy joined Cuscow as Managing Director in December 2018. 2008, sorry. Uh, Cuscow is an end-to-end -end payments provider to more than 100 established and challenger brand clients. Craig is a Director of New Payments Platform Australia Limited and a member of the Australian Payments Council. David Brown is Deputy Head of Payment Settlement Department at the Reserve Bank of Australia. Mm -hmm. David is currently the program director of the RBA's involvement in, the Australian's, in Australia's new payments platform project and RBA's own fast settlement service project. Philip Joyce joined Westpac in 2007 and has been leading a team in their delivery of innovative payment solutions. In his current role as managing director of payments, he has accountability for payment strategy and transformation of Westpac's enterprise hey. payments capabilities. And finally, Susan Bray is general counsel of APCA, Australian Payments and Clearing Association, and has been heavily involved in the conception and 
development of the new payments platform. She established the structure and governance arrangements of the operating company and is heading up the development of the regulatory structure and operating framework for the platform. So thank you to the panel for joining us today. And I think in, I mentioned in my uh, presentation that the, the spark that uh, sort of ignited this whole thing was um, the RBA's innovation review. So I think it's fitting that the, the first question uh, would go to the RBA. And it's a simple question, David, and it's really trying to understand what was the, the background to the, the innovation review and um, you know, what were the main reasons for a push towards a new payment system in Australia. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the Reserve Bank saw a lot of in innovation happening between the banks and their customers, uh, especially in the mobile space. But, but what we didn't see was any successful uh, moves for innovation in the central uh, infrastructure or the, the uh, rails that provide real-time exchange of, of payments between banks. So customers were able to uh, undertake real-time transactions with their banks but the means of transporting those transactions between banks were still happening over a 30-plus-year-old uh, batch system, uh, a direct entry retail system. So that, that was the main uh, driver for us to then initiate the consultation uh, paper that you talked about earlier, mm -hmm. which resulted in the uh, you know, key gaps that the Reserve Bank identified out of that consultation around real-time, the need for real-time payments, real-time funds availability, 24-7 ability to exchange payments, richer data with payments, and uh, a more easy ability to address a payment via mobile or email address. So that challenge was put to the industry and the industry responded. And we ha now have a mm. project well underway. And how do you assess the, the progress made to date? Uh, very good. Uh, I'm really surprised with the level of collaboration uh, within the industry. Uh, the, the 12 main participants that have, uh, are funding the, the project, including the Reserve Bank as a participant, as bankers of the government. Uh, where, you know, there are challenges, there are difficult discussions, but they have, they're being resolved and people are, where, where they're not in agreement with the, the general view, they'll, they will accept that and, and move on. So uh, we're progressing very well, as, as your timetable showed. Mm -hmm. And Susan, the, uh, the industry, we issued a challenge by the Reserve Bank, um, and uh, the industry <laughs> responded um, under the guises of APCA. Um, what, were the, what were the challenges and, and difficulties in, in bringing the banks along this journey and for, forming a committee and um, you know, getting this mm. thing up and running? Okay, I think, I think what the industry has done really well has been to coalesce really quickly around the expectations of the Reserve Bank set out in their strategic objectives. Um, and that built a lot of momentum. Um, I think the most important thing for um, building that momentum and getting the industry to agree was to the, actually the architecture, not just the principles, but that layered architecture, so that we have a basic set of rails um, across which transactions will run, but the real opportunity is in the overlay services. And that provided an incentive for the um, participants to recognize you know, that there is going to be commercial opportunity in overlay services, and we're building something which doesn't just meet the RBA, RBA objectives, but also delivers something for the future. We don't know how payment systems are going to look in the future, but we're building a set of rails for now which will be able to be optimized by the participants and by payment schemes in the future. The, um, the participants are all spending an enormous amount of money on this, not just in the, kind of the central build, albeit modestly priced build, mm. Um, but also in the, in, in, the, in the work that they're doing in their own organizations. And that's a, that's a huge investment. And I think without uh, a clear understanding that this had a capacity to be used flexibly into the future and had a real opportunity to develop systems that were going to generate return, that would have been a really hard sell. And I, so I think that layered architecture was really important in, in generating the will to build the system. Thank you. I might move to um, commercial bank perspective and Philip. Westpac's got a huge footprint in Australia, both in the retail side of things, but also corporate and institutional client base. Um, how are you looking at the new payments platform in terms of, in terms of the opportunity it brings to, to, uh, to Westpac? Thanks, Bill. Um, well, firstly, it's probably to the right audience I'm saying this, but we firmly believe that payments is at the heart of our client relationships in all segments. And you're right, we've got a major footprint in all segments from consumers up to corporate institution and government. 
So if you believe that, if you believe that payments are important, then really you want to be at the forefront of how that evolves. So to, to Susan's point, uh, we know that the world has changed. We know that um, expectations from all customer segments has changed to be much more 24-7, much more um, fast, much more expectation around data. So for us, uh, when the, the aims of the Reserve Bank were set out, I think we've, we've approached it in, yes, it's costly, yes, it's a big investment, but how do we make the most of the opportunity? And actually, the customers that I've spoken to across all segments really see value in speed, data, addressing, and availability, and how it can help them run their business. So I think it's anchored in new tools that can be applied to customers to help enable their business. So that's how we're thinking about it, because we think that if we can apply some of those new tools that don't exist in the current payment systems, then we can help our customers achieve their business goals. So from a corporate treasurer who will get much more effective data and therefore have much better reconciliation, lower cost, to uh, an SME or a tradesperson accepting a non-card payment at the weekend, there's lots and lots of use stories. The, th the things we think about from a commercial perspective is, well, number one, how do we apply that to customers to, to help them? Mm. Number two, how are we different? You know, this is an industry offer, so um, there's 12 participants. We'll have uh, formal SLAs around how the, the core products will work. So I think how you're different and how you offer that so you're competitive and you get more market share is a really interesting problem for banks. And thirdly, how do we integrate some of this new offering into existing services for our customers. Our customers don't sit there and go, oh, great, there's a new payments platform that's going to do everything <laughs> for me. Uh, they wonder how it's going to help their business in conjunction with everything else. So for us, the way we, we view it is definitely an opportunity. Definitely our customers are interested. Uh, and we're looking to apply that in ways that will really help us deepen our, deepen our client relationships. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Craig, the, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around this concept of overlay services. and. Um, uh, you know, the, the separation of that from the, the basic infrastructure. That model, um, how do you think that's going to allow for, for innovation uh, into the future um, once this system is live? Yeah, thanks, Bill. I, I think you referred to that in your presentation. I don't think you should underestimate the importance of the structural approach that we've taken. So I think in the past, confusing how we might advance infrastructure with how we want to compete with one another has been an impediment to progress. So. Um, when we decided early on that we'd collaborate around building the basic infrastructure and leave the market forces to compete and how they'd productize that or bring overlay services to market, I think that was a, a real key turning point in making significant progress. Um, to quantify what that looks like in the market today, we've got some institutions that have paid little or no attention to the build of the infrastructure and have focused all of their attention on how they might productize that uh, when it comes to market. And, and they're focusing on building overlays or, or other services. Um, and obviously, some will, will focus on both. But that's been pretty important structurally. Uh, the other thing I'd talk about is the cycle that we see in terms of innovation. So when people find an opportunity to arbitrage or build a new application or service because something's not working at the moment, that's often at the application layer. And you'll often have different applications come forward to the market at the one time on different platforms. So we tend to go through a cycle where you see a wave of innovation and then a push for consolidation in operating platforms in a drive for ubiquity and efficiency. What we're seeing in the MPP is that uh, where I think it will help flush out some innovation is people have some certainty about a ubiquitous platform um, that they'll have some continuity and certainty about for some time to come. So they'll have the freedom to go and build uh, their innovation into their overlays or their products and services uh, knowing that they've got a platform to plug into. Good, thank you. Um, I think at this point we might see if we have any questions from the audience. And please, if you do ask a question, tell us where you're from and, uh, and speak uh, into the microphone, which are being moved around now. Thank you. I'm Lamin Sanya, Eco Bank Gambia. Just want to ask a question. If this product is going to be straight through from initiation to settlement, Anyone want to take that one? I can. Uh, the simple answer is yes. I mean, the end-to-end -end clearing and settlement flow will, will occur in seconds. And, and there are SLAs around uh, SWIFT and the participants and the Reserve Bank's settlement service to ensure uh, that is met. Each transaction is settled individually. I mean, there could be at the bank level, some, some limits that are put in place around transaction sizes and things like that. 
where there could be some, some sort of holding step where things need to be approved, but in general, the, the, the approach is meant to be that it's STP from end to end, from app to app, if you like, um, across the whole system, including the settlement. Anybody else? Nakam I think Nakamuli, IBM. How are you responding to the requirement for expanded remittance data? Anyone want to take that one? I'm happy to, to fill that one. Uh, at the moment, there's a whole body of work underway around uh, the, the ISO 2002 templates and um, defining what those look like. Um, and really looking at that from the Australian context, but also keep bearing in mind um, global harmonization of ISO 2022. Um, and that's defining what the, all the, the participants will use in terms of the templates. At the overlay level, though, there may be room for defining even more standardization into the remittance data, um, because there may be a particular use case that, that um, um, you know, some of the banks sign up to for servicing corporates, for instance, to allow for reconciliation into their systems. And in that case, they would need to agree on, on, a, on a format that, that can be STP'd, um, not just from the, the gateways, but back into the, the corporates who are sitting behind that, um, that whole chain. And I, maybe I'll just add to that, uh, as part of the basic payment uh, that all banks are agreeing to carry, there'll be uh, 280 characters of unstructured data that uh, participants or customers can, can use that will flow end to end. So that, that's a big expansion on the current sort of 18 characters, 18 characters in, the, today. in the batch systems today. Yep. There's a lot more hands I saw. Hi, Trish McSweeney from uh, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce in Canada. I'm, I'm wondering about the funding and, and why you went with the utility company and, and how that was funded. Okay, that one might That's be more Susan. I think. <laughs> um, so I think because of the layered architecture where all of the commercial opportunity and value is going to be in the overlay services and what we're, tr we're trying to keep the, the basic company and the basic functionality in the centre of the basic infrastructure very lean, um, that really did lend itself to having a mutually owned utility. So that does mean that the, the ticket to play in the centre is that you have to become a shareholder of the company. You know, and, and with that funding burden comes the, the rights to be a decision maker within the company, to make sure that that, that company continues to operate in that lean, um, infrastructural way for time to come and doesn't start developing a life of its own, because that will be controlled by the participants who are actually generating their revenue in the overlay services and, not, and the other ways that they use that. That's not to say that there isn't an opportunity for smaller participants to become involved in the system. And I know that the, the issue of access, particularly among the smaller institutions, is a very kind of live concern, particularly in Europe at the moment. We've been having conversations with the, with the UK Faster Payments team and their um, new access regime to enable that for smaller participants. I think we're in a very different market in Australia and that there's, there's a very um, well-contested um, market for the provision of those payment services you know, by our larger banks, such as Westpac here and also by um, Cuskill, who provides a lot of those payment services to small institutions. So there will be the capacity for other institutions to participate in an indirect sense through making, you know, commercial, having commercial relationships and partnerships with those other institutions. So it's, it's, it's an open system in that you can participate directly if you become a shareholder, but it also has capacity for, for others to participate in a, di in a different way. I might um, just ask a question to Craig here before we go back to the audience, because it does relate to what you were just saying. Um, and Cuscal does service the, uh, um, a lot of smaller and challenger brand name clients, and um, um, you're providing those payment services into more than one payment system today, and MPP will be the next. And how is that level of client or that uh, size of institution looking at the new payments platform? Yeah, so we have, a, we have a pretty diverse client base and I think their attitude and response has been equally diverse. So we've got a number of clients that are very excited about the fact that they're going to be there at the beginning and if they respond accordingly, they won't be playing catch up for the rest of their life. And it'd be fair to say that we have a pocket of clients that see this as by and large a compliance program, one that won't get a lot of traction for a couple of years, so they're in more of a wait and see mode. But, but as I mentioned earlier, um, there are a number of clients that are excited about the fact that they don't have to take care of the connectivity, the compliance, the maintenance element, and they're focusing on how they might productize this and bring it to market, so, and not being left behind because they'll be there at the beginning. So I actually think we'll have, um, we'll have a different way of starting what is a new um, uh, payment system in Australia versus where we've started from historically. So 
It's normally started in the hands of a minority and grown out. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think it's definitely going to be more broadly accessed and leveraged in this case. That's good. Um, I saw a few more hands. Anyone question down the front here? Just a mic here, or sorry, one at the back, and then we'll come to the front. Uh, Burak Özbut from Ishbank. Uh, I want to uh, have some details about the settlement site. Uh, for timing for uh, swift payments, generally banks are uh, opening accounts on other banks and using uh, their other banks for reimbursement. And in this system, how is, is this handled? Does each bank uh, have an account in the central bank site? So how is it happening? An exchange. A big question yes. for you, David. Yeah. Uh, so the, fast, the new fast settlement service will use banks' existing exchange settlement accounts. So all direct participants will have uh, one account, as they do today, for settling their high value. Uh, that same account and shared pool of liquidity will be used to settle their uh, new NPP payments. Uh, indirect participants uh, that might connect via Cuskill do have the option of using an account with the central bank or they can uh, use uh, and share Cuskill's exchange settlement account. Yeah, th there's some peculiar arrangements to take into consideration. So um, a lot of our clients net out all of their settlement activity. So they might be um, net payers in certain payment streams and net recipients in others and they would use us to consolidate and net all of that uh, liquidity position out. Uh, I'd say a number of them are inclined to do the same with NPP and get the same benefit of that net settlement effect as opposed to going one out and doing um, NPP separate from their other payment activities. And while on the topic of net settlement, um, one of the unique features of NPP is this line by line settlement that, um, that uh, the Reserve Bank um, put a stake in the ground quite early on and committed towards. Um, it's a bit of a departure in what other payment systems have, have done in the past. David, what's, what's the rationale for that and um, how do you think this will benefit um, the community? Uh, yeah, well, it's a common question I get asked. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I suppose we asked ourselves that when we were looking at uh, settlement options for this new payments platform that really you know, is the platform for the next 20, 20 to 30 years, at least in Australia. Uh, I suppose we asked, our asked ourselves the question, why not do real-time uh, settlement? Uh, the technology does support it these days, that the fast switching uh, of transactions across networks between systems you know, is very mature today. We, we uh, consulted with our, our IT department who were able to prove that we could uh, undertake settlements in uh, milliseconds and at a rate of over a thousand settlements per second and that the the cost of developing this sort of solution wouldn't be too high so we're up for the challenge we we're asking uh, the banks to you know, move into real-time clearing uh, and do it on a 24 7 basis uh, we thought uh, it made sense for us to do the same so compared to other models where uh, there might be separate you know, batch settlement arrangements and therefore the liquidity and sender caps and uh, separate collateral uh, um, and then failure to settlement arrangements had to be arranged. Well, we don't have those issues. This is all consolidated liquidity, consolidated collateral for settlement of all, all payments. It's, it's RTGS for everyone. That's a good quote. I might use that one. <laughs> Um, we'll just come to the front here. You had your hand up for some time. Do you have a mic? Can someone come in here? Hi, sorry. Ed Doyle of BA Systems uh, Applied Intelligence. Um, so my question to the panel is that we have seen initiatives like this before, for example, faster payments in the UK. When that was introduced, we saw changes in the modality of attack um, in financial crime from various different organised mm -hmm. crime bodies. What um, planning and preparation has the industry and the RBA taken on in preparation for potential uh, misuse of the new infrastructure, which I'm sure will be a tremendous um, <coughs> success in, in Australia? Maybe 
feel uh, in terms of uh, a commercial bank perspective on how you look at uh, financial crime in this real-time real -time payments world. Um, do, you, do you have an answer for that? Yeah, look, I think the, there is the, the belief that a faster system allows misuse. So I think part of the work we're doing at both organizations ourselves, so what's our risk appetite, what systems do we have today that can help control that flow? So for a lot of banks, actually part of, to Susan's point earlier, why the investment case for this is quite heavy is we're going to have to uplift existing capabilities to adapt to a world that's really quick with, with greater data. So that a large part of that cost is applied to risk, AML, sanctions. Mm. Um, so that's a big impost for us. So that's each bank will do that, and each bank, I think, will probably, while they've got the hood of the car up, will look to uplift capability that can apply across more than NPP. That's certainly how we're thinking about it. And then there's the work we do at an industry level. So how do we agree on protocols such that we can be a safer network? And that work's underway. Um, but it certainly is it's front of mind for us to go, how do we ensure we don't, um, our risk appetite both as a bank and as a network isn't increased beyond where we want it to be. So it's, uh, it's definitely front of mind and lots of work underway. You have a question down the front here? Thank you. I'm Stefana from BCG. I just have one question on the expected benefits. And I'd like to know to which extent you expect the benefit to come from the richer remittance data versus the uh, immediate settlement. Craig, I'll, did you want to? I'll give it, I'll start off okay, if sure. that's all right. Um, <coughs> I think the, the, first, the first point to note is that uh, it's interesting because we're uh, in the midst of putting our business case together that goes to our board actually in December. So partly the business case itself and the benefit itself is remaining relevant to your customers in something that's really important for their business, which is payments. So that's the kind of higher order belief that I think most banks have entered this into. Then actually everything else is really complex. It's which existing instruments will migrate from existing payment channels with certain revenue attributes from credit cards with interchange to you know, higher value payments with a large per transaction cost to lower value payments with a low transaction cost. So the benefit case really, for me, hinges on can you remain relevant to your customers and help them enable their business in better, smarter ways than you can do today? And I think we'd all believe that's the case. Then it's really very assumption-based around what component's going to add more value. Interestingly for me, in my client conversations, I've downplayed previously kind of speed and availability. And I was much more of the mind, to your point, of data's going to be the, the heart of benefit. But actually, what's emerged in, in my own conversations is each of those attributes of speed, of data, of availability and addressing, each of those have some applicability to certain customers. Um, probably most of us would think if we can really get to a point where we can enable some industry sectors with standards that unlock efficiencies, where there's lots of paper moving amongst participants, we think there's probably efficiencies there. So data is certainly an area where where we think there's opportunity. Quite how we dimension the benefits, really difficult. Thank you. Yeah, Bill, I, I might just add to that. I, I, think, um, I think in retail banking generally, um, but in payments specifically, there are three themes that are dominating, and that is mobility, the desire for consumers and businesses um, to be able to transact, access information almost anywhere at any time on any device. Um, the, the push towards real time, the, the concept that you could make an inquiry now or want to do something today and that's not available to you until next business day or overnight is unacceptable. And the last that we haven't really spoken about is the data and analytics. That if you think about the mobile world and everything happening in real time and the way you need to be better informed about your consumers uh, and they're going to want to better leverage data, uh, transfer opportunities, uh, those three driving demands from both consumers and business, I think, are well served by this platform. To predict how it'll be productized and used in the future would be pretty bold. I think you'll see this applied in many ways that we haven't even conceived at this point. Build it and they will come. Um, anyone else in the audience? No? Um, I guess uh, one of the big themes this week has been around disruptive technologies and uh, you know, the promises of... Um, faster, cheaper, easier payments. And um, I'm curious in terms of the domestic con um, context whether um, something like the MPP provides a counter for, for the, um, those claims in terms of 
the customer propositions that may may come. Um, so I'm wondering, Philip, if, if you've given thought to this, and, and you know, I'm sure you've you've been to some of the blockchain and Ripple sort of discussions. Um, how do you, how do you look at these? Can you can you look at MPP as a as a way for the banks to to show their innovation and um, compete, if you like, with these technologies? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and obviously blockchain disruption the the uh, the key words for this week. One way of thinking about it is in the Australian context, there is clearly some friction points in today's payment systems that don't allow customers to do what they want to do. So payments outside of business hours, um, incomplete information. And what happens is then companies um, think about different ways riding on top of existing rails to solve customer problems. So I think you could think of MPP as reducing friction points because it will have greater availability, it will have greater speed and data and so forth. But the, the, my conclusion is there's still plenty of room to innovate. So I think the, this is not a silver bullet that suddenly removes. In fact, I wouldn't want that. I don't think any of us would want that. I think there's plenty of room for, for innovators to come in and help. My personal view is actually through time that innovation disruption will move into the value chain of our customers more deeply. And probably like our organization, I think most participants are thinking, how do we harness some of that bright thinking on top of the platform? And hence that structure that uh, Susan Craig and uh, David and yourself, Bill, have talked about that overlay structure really is a pathway to help us harness that. Yeah. So we're quite, um, we're reasonably bullish that that is a pathway for us to, to help um, deliver more innovation more sustainably and hopefully allow more participants to, to pull some great ideas into the payment space. So, hmm. Good. Um, is there any more questions from the audience? I've still got some to cover if, you, if there is none. Uh, we've got one over here. Hi, I'm back again. Um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the collateral pool that you mentioned, the shared collateral pool around settlement. Yes, okay, good question. So the way the, the new fast settlement service is a separate system to our current high value RTGS system. Uh, however, it will be sharing common infrastructure, uh, common uh, networks, common user access to the systems, but we will have two pools of uh, liquidity supported by one set of collateral. Now those two pools of liquidity, when RTGS is open, will be uh, shared. Uh, so we are setting up the ability for the fast settlement service for banks to say, uh, I want a minimum of 100 million and a maximum of uh, 1 billion in, our, in my fast settlement se service pool. And there, uh, liquidity will automatically transfer between uh, the two systems, the wholesale and the retail, essentially, depending on where their balance is at the time uh, of day. When our wholesale system, our wholesale RTGS system closes, the total liquidity available that the banks have will be moved into the fast settlement service. So over the weekend, overnight, uh, they will have access to their total uh, liquidity pool and, and they were able to increase that liquidity pool ahead of uh, long weekends to ensure that you know, th th there are s sufficient funds to settle payments. Anybody else? We've probably got time for one more. If not, uh, I'll uh, use the opportunity to ask my question around uh, Swift's involvement in this process. Um, it is Swift Auditorium, after all. Um, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty well known that um, this is the first of this type of system for Swift. Um, and some would look at it as, um, you know, a bit of a risk to, to go with Swift um, for, their f you know, for this to be their first system of this nature. But what was it about the, the Swift um, um, solution and engagement that, that saw them eventually selected? And that's an open question. I don't know who wants to. OK, well, I can, take I can it. kick it off if you like. I think in the, uh, in the tender process, the actual attitude displayed by Swift in that process of being really flexible, really responsive, and indicating that they really wanted to have a partnership with the industry. Because we knew this was a, a strategic positioning for you as well. So obviously, if, you know, if, if, if you're getting something out of it, then we understood that you would be, you know, you'd be try, trying really hard to meet our needs. So I think that kind of flexibility um, and your ability to come to the table and deliver what we wanted and to truly understand that unique architecture because um, it, it is novel and you understood how that was, that was going to operate and what the requirements were around that. So um, I think that's probably that, that attitude displayed by SWIFT was, a, was a, 
Okay. A good step so in the right direction. The other things were given, you know, the speed and cost and, you know, throughput mm. capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Well, everybody could supply those, but I think it was the attitude. I think, Bill, in our case, uh, if you look at an initiative that was funded at the centre through a bunch of competing people having to come together and collaborate, uh, the most important, one of the most important criteria in selecting a vendor was that they had to add to the collaborative effort, um, uh, not divide it. So, uh, you know, the last thing we wanted was a position taken by a vendor that, that all the participants couldn't collaborate around and agree on. And I think one of the things that SWIFT did very, er did very well very early on was demonstrate some flexibility, humility, the ability to work through and partner on issues. Uh, that and your knowledge of the message standard, I think, were standouts. That's good. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, praise. <laughs> um, you can okay, buy me a beer later. <laughs> hopefully my boss is here. <laughs> <laughs> We're on full time now, so uh, um, please just thank our panel now, and, um, and thank you all for attending this session.